to say one more time, thank you so much for coming to this, the 31st straight Pepperdine lectureship directed by either Jerry Rushford or me. <laughs> I hope it's been a good week despite a little heat in here last night and this morning. I've heard some great stories of people's weeks of their arrivals. My favorite so far is the two men who arrived in the middle of the night on Tuesday night from Michigan. It was so late we'd shut down everything. Nobody was in Lectureship Central, nobody was anywhere. So they wandered around campus looking to find out how you can get in a dorm room at two in the morning. They finally found a man, I just learned this story today, they, they finally found a man in the middle of campus and they began telling him what happened, asking him what should they do, only to find out that the George Pepperdine statue would not respond to them. <laughs> Still giving guidance after all these years, he is. Well, as you know, there are fires a bit to the north of Abilene, uh, of uh, Malibu, we're all safe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there probably are in Abilene. Far to the north, we're, we're fine here. It's going to be 95 in Los Angeles today. It's hot in here, and I'm speaking on hell. <clears throat> it's all a part of the ambiance the director has to his control. And uh, let's maybe pray one more time. May these words breathe fresh light. May they speak new life into us, O oh God. And toward that end, will you please pour through me the gift of preaching. Give me stamina and joy as I preach, knowing that you are the one who was and is and is to come. And toward that, we pray in the name of Jesus and we all say, Amen. I'm guessing that for many of you, this is your first study of Revelation in a long time. For some of you, it's your first study of Revelation ever. It's the first time at the Pepperdine Bible Lectures. But don't think that we're alone in that. There are a lot of traditions that don't really know what to do with Revelation. For example, those traditions, those tribes that work through the three-year common lectionary don't get much Revelation. Revelation's been well edited. There's seven little readings through the seven years or through the three year cycle. But they're carefully edited. I think the most odd is that they have a reading from the end of Revelation 22, but they edit out the part that says, don't take anything away from this reading, <laughs> which is a bold choice. <laughs> and out of those seven lectionary readings, none. None are from my seven chapters today, and I understand why. Maybe you understand these words from Nietzsche, who said, Revelation is the most rabid outburst of vindictiveness in all recorded history. Keep in mind, that was before middle school students had access to Twitter and Facebook, but... <laughs> Even saying that, that's, that's saying a lot. And when you come into Revelation 14 to 20, it's filled with wrath. It's filled with blood, filled with justice. And, and maybe the first thing to say on the front end is that while that is true, those always in Scripture are leading towards something. It's no wonder that Steinbeck got the title of his greatest novel from my text, The Grapes of Wrath. There's a lot of wrath here. But when you think of the wrath of God, you must not think of a little child who's flailing out of control and angry, hitting everything in sight. It's not that. God's not doing that. You think more of the wrath of a loving creator or the wrath of a loving parent who so loves this child, or in the case of the creator, so loves creation 
that the creator or the parent wants all things to be well. And they're moving everything inexorably toward that. When God experiences wrath, when God brings justice, it is toward the ultimate goal of rebooting God's good world. It's leading toward restoration. It's leading toward God getting God's way in God's world. He's not a child flailing out of control. God is a loving parent who seeks to make all things right, which is why the prophets anticipate the day of the renewal of all things, toward which Rick will speak tonight. So yes, there is a lot of justice. And yes, there is a lot of wrath, but it's leading toward something. It's leading toward God's great desires. And if God didn't have any wrath, he would somehow be complicit with all of the evil. If he could just stand idly by and experience nothing, we'd have to ask, are you really a loving creator? Are you really a loving parent? You feel nothing? You have ambivalence with all of the pain and suffering? The saints are crying out, how long, O oh Lord? And you're just crossing your arms and have eye earbuds in? No, God's response is wrath. God executes his justice because he's moving everything toward a grand conclusion. So when we come to Revelation, as the seven of us who've been preaching have studied together, we've come to recognize that in Revelation, the goal is not to lay it out like some prophecy map on a table and draw connections. That's, that's not the goal. That's, that's not what this is about. Sometime when you get a chance, go to Wikipedia and type in the words, list of dates predicted for apocalyptic events. <laughs> I'm not kidding. There is a long list of all of the failed attempts. And whenever anybody has figured out when it's going to be, would you like to guess when that is? It's just about a year away. It, but it's in our lifetime. But time after time, the trash basket of history gets littered with these failed attempts. Because apparently, that's not what Revelation is doing. When you speak about prophecy in Revelation, it's like Isaiah, and it's like Ezekiel, not Nostradamus. It's leading us towards something. I think of it as a way to live in the city of of Pergamon, because I know that one best. My dear friend James Walters took me through and showed me that city. And as you watch this video behind me, I tell you what I imagine. I imagine that I've got these two little girls. I've got my granddaughters. I've got one in each arm. And we're walking through the Acropolis of Pergamum, as reimagined on a computer here. We walk down, we stop in the stoa there at the bottom, at the bottom of the amphitheater leading to the temple of Dionysus. And we remember that two stories are being told everywhere, being told through inscriptions, being told through statues, fountains, buildings, everything. And then we might point up and look at the temple of Athena at the top and then come down and look at the majesty of the altar of Zeus who appears to be on his throne down below, we might peek at the Agora where people are selling their silver trinkets in honor of Zeus or in honor of the emperor. Down below, we might see people running athletic games, knowing that, again, it was in honor of Rome or in honor of the gods and goddesses of Greece. But just to take a moment and walk with my little girls up on top of the Acropolis and start to walk around, as you're viewing it, the great altar of Zeus, look at the frieze at the bottom with the relief on it, telling the stories of the conquering of humans by the gods and goddesses of Greece. To imagine the 40 yards wide, the 40 yards deep, going up these steps and now looking over the valley below and imagining that this is the world where two great stories dominate, the story of the power of Rome, who is now being thought of as the savior of the world, and the story of the gods and goddesses of Greece. And I walk my little girls through there, and I try to tell them, these are not the stories we believe. 
These two stories that everybody's telling, they're telling down in the Stoa as they hang around and chat. They're telling on the road to the Temple of Dionysus as they try to go beg fertility. They're telling about it at the bottom of the hill, at the Asclepium, as people from all over Turkey come to get healed of their diseases. They're telling about it up on top and down below every place. They're telling the stories of the power of Rome and the majesty of the Greek gods and goddesses. And I'm telling my little girls, that's not what we believe. Now, the bad thing is, that appears to be winning. If Pergamum had about 200,000 people at the time, just imagine a tiny little house church of Christ followers. The good stories are the ones being preached out there, the stories of power and majesty, but we're telling a story of one who came and was slaughtered for us. And so I just imagine walking them through the streets saying, this isn't our story right here. And then having to explain that our dear friend Antipas, who may have been like a granddad to them, like an uncle to them, our dear friend Antipas has just died for his faith. How would you sustain faith in a moment like that? How would you hold on? Some of you understand what it's like to be the vast minority. I don't for the most part. I, I do remember back in uh, 1969, it was December 6th, 1969, we were at what's called the game of the century. Now, I think there are probably several game of the centuries. But the one I believe in was played December 6th, 1969 in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Number one, Texas was playing number two, Arkansas. My dad scored four tickets, so mom and dad and my little brother and I went to that hallowed stadium that seats 50,019 people, at least it did in 1969, and out of 50,019, I'd say 50,000 were Arkansas Razorback fans. And have you ever seen an Arkansas Razorback fan? It's quite a thing to behold, dressed in red, pig snouts on their faces, with waves of woo, pig suey, going across the stadium. President Nixon helicoptered in at the last minute, secret servicemen around him as the praise team continued. Woo, pig, suey, hallelujah. <laughs> 50,000 people dressed in red. I can name four people dressed in burnt orange. I've told people many times, I didn't have to learn curse words in high school. I learned them at that game. <laughs> my, my parents, I was born in Missouri. I was raised there. But for a brief time, they took me, the firstborn, down to Austin, Texas, while they finished their degrees. Apparently, my first spoken words were hook 'em horns. So they dressed us up in burnt orange. They marched us into that stadium. And we were surrounded by this sea. Oh, there it is. There's some burnt orange there. No pig snouts yet. I'm not seeing any of those out here. But to just realize what it's like to be this tiny little group in a sea that's opposed to you. And now I'm trying to explain to my little girls, this is, this is who we are. We're, we're just a small little handful, but we don't ultimately believe that Zeus sits on the throne. We do not believe that the emperor is worthy of our worship. We believe that God alone who sits on a throne, mentioned 28 times in this book, we believe that that God is worthy of our worship. And we believe that the one that we follow is a lamb who was slaughtered on our behalf. Now that lets me walk into the book of Revelation so that now I'm ready for the very first word of the book in the Greek language, apokalupsis which means it's unavailing. Now, we've taken the word apocalyptic and it describes anything going on in our world. It was an apocalyptic moment. The fire was apocalyptic. The earthquake was apocalyptic. But to borrow from my dear friend, Anigo Montoyu, I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> Apocalypsis means an unveiling. It means we pull back the curtain it's like in the Wizard of Oz when they finally get to the Emerald City and they're trembling before the great and wonderful Wizard of Oz. And then the hero of the story, the little dog Toto, goes over and 
pulls the curtain back, and the little man keeps going, and he says, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. But it's over at that point. He's been exposed. It's an unveiling. Revelation does that. It's not prophecy maps. It's a grand vision. It's, it's a huge billboard. It's, it's 3D. It's political cartoon. But it's an imaginative way to say to you, you may be a tiny little minority in that city and those other cities, but your story is right, and you will win because this is God's team. It may look like you're going down. It may look like all odds are against you, but you will win. This is the definitive story of all time. And so I can just imagine getting this little help, this little nudging from John, and now I've got a new vision to teach my little girls, to tell my granddaughters this story. This is God's perspective. We're looking with God's eyes. It's not out of control. It looks like all hell's broken loose, but it hasn't. All things are in the hands of a good and loving and trustworthy God. And so he launches out the text that Rich handled so well. This great vision of Jesus in the beginning, not baby Jesus, not Christmas Jesus, but this large vision of Jesus, the one who is the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the true and living witness. He knows us and he's in the midst of us. And you want to leapfrog to chapter four, to God on the throne, but as Eugene Peterson says, you always have to go through the mess of the church because God loves the church, and God's working in and among and sometimes despite the church. And then chapter four, which fate brought us before so well, the throne of God, so that when you see it, you realize, okay, there's some other stories about thrones, but the only one really on a throne is the God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Holy, holy, holy. And then chapter five, which Dave led us into the, the story of the lamb. He hears that there is a lion, but when he looks, he doesn't see a lion. He sees a slaughtered lamb, a defining image for Jesus all the way through the book. And with the help of Greg Stevenson, that's guided us in this image through the book, that whatever you think is going on, it must be defined by one who laid down his life that's the battle he fought. And then chapter 6 through 11, Don did that so masterfully to take us through the seven seals and the seven trumpets leading to the two witnesses who look like they lost, but lo and behold, they are raised just like the one they follow was raised on the third day. And then last night for Randy to take us to that exploration of those great enemies, the dragon and the beast and the other beast, and to remind us that nothing human can stand against God. So I pick up there. Some of you are now nervous. I've gone a long time, and we've still got seven chapters to go. <laughs> but I'm going to do the Reader's Digest verse, version. I feel a symphony building. Uh, when the seven seals are opened, a fourth of everything is destroyed. When the seven trumpets are blown, a third of everything is destroyed, and now when we get to the seven bowls, it's complete destruction because God wants God's way, and so there's going to be justice and wrath. Chapter 15, we get indications that these seven bowls are going to in the come, will be in the context of the Exodus. There's a tabernacle, there are plagues, and there is the song of Moses and of the Lamb. So this is a new Exodus moment. Bowls of judgment are poured out. Warning about a battle of Armageddon that we'll get back to in a moment comes in chapter 16 and verse 16. And now, now it's time to deal with the enemies. We've named them in chapters 12 and 13. Now let's deal with them. Let's start in chapters 17 and 18 with that one that is so prominent called here Babylon. But most certainly in light of the description referring to Rome. Uh, Rome liked to be pictured as this powerful world, a beautiful woman riding atop seven hills. Here we have political cartoon. It's a beautiful woman, but she's riding on a beast with seven heads, and it calls her a great prostitute. In fact, it gives her name in verse 5. 
Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. That's her name. Be a lot to get on a Hi, My Name Is card. Hi, my name is Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth, but that's her name. You may have a sweet little name for her, but that's not who she is. She's got a lovely goblet. Look at the goblet on the outside, so beautiful. But when you look what's inside the goblet, it's the blood of the saints. That's the blood of the saints. She's riding on this, this beast with seven heads, and, and the seven heads represent seven hills, and there are seven kings, and again, I'm going to take the caveat that all my previous speakers have taken. I don't know what all of that is, but I think it's wise probably not to try to analyze this corresponds to that, that corresponds to that. It's just kind of a perfect description. She looks like, it, <clears throat> like it's an impregnable kingdom. But destruction's gonna come from within. Execution will come. So in chapter 18, you get some people cheering on the destruction because of all the economic injustice, because of all the treatment of humanity. One point even saying that she traded in human flesh. A complete condemnation of the slavery that's going on there. But while that's going on, there are two people crying, two groups crying. They're the kings of the earth. They're crying because somebody's lost power. They don't like to see anybody lose power. And they depended on the emperor. And the other group was the merchants. They're crying because they liked the economic injustice. It served them well. But by the end of chapter 18, there is no doubt about it. The lamb will not ultimately let that kind of injustice stand. The story of Rome is not a lasting story then, and it's not now. There's another story that's greater. Chapter 19, it's time to deal with the beast. So we've got to pull up the beast. And we're going to have a battle. There is a rider on a white horse, which we find out is the same one who is the slaughtered lamb. In fact, the rider on the white horse comes on the scene, and there's already blood on his outfit. Why would you guess he already has blood before the battle? Because it's his blood. It's the way he's been defined from the very beginning. He fights this battle by laying down his life for all humanity. He's got a sword, but it's not in his hand like Braveheart. Not in his hand like Aragorn, it's coming out of his mouth, the prophetic word of God. So he comes, and we're getting ready for this great battle scene. <laughs> and it winds up being the worst battle scene in history. <laughs> because how do you battle the one who is king of kings and lord of lords? How do you battle one who laid down his life for the world and was raised by the Father on the third day? How would you fight that battle, really? It'd be like having a football game between the Dallas Cowboys and the local Pee Wee football team. No, really, it'd be more like having the San Francisco 49ers <laughs> battle the local Pee Wee football team. It, there's just no contest here. And so you're waiting. You're waiting for the battle to happen. Everybody's on edge. And the next thing you know, you're looking in the rearview mirror and saying, when was the battle? Well, it wasn't really a battle. It was an execution. It was a great battle fought, but I'll tell you what, I really believe this, the battle of Armageddon, has already ultimately been won because he fought the great battle against the forces of evil and the powers of darkness and dominion when he laid down his life on a cross. He lives with blood on him. He lives risen from the dead by God, and that is the way of the church. We don't fight the world, nor are we just trying to blend into the world. We live a redemptive life as faithful witnesses in the midst of the world. No wonder Jesus is first identified as the true and living witness because it's going to echo and reverberate through the church to say, and that's who you are, my dear brothers and sisters. You are witnesses to the one who laid down his life for this world that God loves. Well, that's Rome. Those are the beasts. Chapter 20. Well, shoot, I don't have time for the millennium. Um, <laughs> my best recommendation on this is it's already on iTunes U. Go listen to the discussion John Wilson did of the millennial positions. But I'll tell you what I think's going on here. It's already been hinted at at the last half of chapter 12, and that is that there is a defeat of Satan that is full and complete 
but it's not yet seen in its completeness. But there's another day coming that it will be seen in its completeness. That's the story that's told at the end of chapter 12, and it's reiterated here. He has come up. We've faced off the other enemies. Now you've got to take on the dragon. You've got to take on Satan, and he does. How does he win? We already know. He laid down his life. And Satan was defeated by that sacrificial act so that now he's on a short leash for a thousand years. I don't really like somebody to call my position amillennialism because I, I do believe in a millennial reign. It's just symbolic to me like the rest of the book. But when I think of this period, symbolically perhaps here, a thousand years, we're in it right now. We're in the time when Satan's been defeated by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but that's not the final moment. So what we need now is a final moment, and that brings us to chapter 20 and verse 7, because one day God will throw that wily rascal into the pits of hell, into gnashing and darkness, and he will be done with. That day is out there. I've told people this year as I've done these revelation workshops that I've come to love the word lachrymos. It means filled with tears or tear-inducing. Like if you go to a great orchestra performance, you might say it was lachrymos. Or if you went to a sixth grade orchestra performance, right, you might say it was lachrymos. It brought tears. But it's a good way of describing this world that there are tears everywhere. What we need is for a day when God wipes away all tears. And I'll hand the baton to Rick, and he'll pick up from there. But what I did want to say is that every Easter for a long time, we had two traditions. One of them was discontinued a couple years ago. But while I was in Abilene preaching every Easter, one tradition was we would go to our daughter's grave every Easter and we would read 1 Corinthians 15 and remember that death does not get the final word with our daughter. The other tradition continues, and that is I get up early, early on Easter morning and I listen to the whole Messiah. But I have to tell you, I'm a bad listener. After all these years, I realize I stink at listening to the Messiah because I want the hallelujah chorus. And it takes forever to get there. I'm, I'm listening. I'm waiting. Christ is born. Hallelujah. In fact, we usually hear it at Christmas. Wrong time. Hallelujah chorus doesn't come after Jesus is born. But the Messiah goes on, and Jesus is killed, and he's raised, and now I'm ready to burst forth. How? No, not time. Not time yet. Handel Nuta, you got to wait. And that's why, no wonder his text comes right out of Revelation 19. You get the word hallelujah only four times in the New Testament, and all four in Revelation 19. Because it's not after the birth of Jesus. It's not after his death. It's not after his resurrection. But it is after God continues his work of renewal and his justice, and after God sends his faithful witnesses into the world, that you can then cry out, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 